Greetings! Today we are going to repair an Oculus Rift Development Kit 2 Virtual Reality Headset. The owner brought this in personally, so he had to pay attention to maintaining a certain degree of socially acceptable behavior while doing the repair and while creating video documentation of it and that pushed my multitasking capabilities to their limits. So please excuse the poor quality of the footage. Initial problem was no signs of life whatsoever. Usually what you'd expect to see upon power up is a blue LED doing some blinking and a yellow LED indicating that the HDMI input is not valid. So we started to take it apart. There are four screws right next to the lenses. The lenses themselves could and should have been left in place to avoid getting dust in between them and the screen. And then there are four more screws underneath rubber plugs. That was very easy to get inside. No plastic separation tool needed, like for DK1. On the left you can see the infrared LED assembly, which is intended for motion sensing. But until now, every major app seems to be using the accelerometer data, which seems to be sufficient. Let's take that off for convenience. Here's the main board. It has an ST Microelectronics ARM Cortex based STM32L100 microprocessor on it. Five LED driver chips in the middle and in the top right corner there's something that might be a step up converter because it has a big inductor in the middle and that's going to be used to get through the forward voltage of dozens of infrared LEDs in the other assembly. After some probing on the main board, I realized that there's absolutely no voltage coming in, so we have to suspect the cable to be our culprit. Then I plugged in a trusted USB cable, and that didn't work either, so that was very disappointing. But later I learned that the Rift only works when an HDMI connection is established as well didn't film this because my camera battery was running low, but I sacrificed a USB extension cable, cut it up in the middle, reconnected the ground connection and left the 5V connection open so that I could measure the current intake of that USB cable on its own, so that I could see whether or not there are any active components in the tiny little box in the middle. With that contraption I measured that the USB cable on its own treated itself to a whopping 500 milliamps, which is basically all that a standard USB connection can provide. To demonstrate that that behavior is abnormal, I connected something like an FPGA demo board with many colorful LEDs to my USB port and when I plugged in the defect probably shorted USB cable, the LED light show shut down. I did that because the next step involved something like a leap of faith, because we had to literally crack open the little intermediate box in the USB cable, 
and that's gonna be destructive because the box is sealed with an ultrasonic weld. But it was absolutely worth it. As you can see here the soldering on that tiny little board is so terrible. And don't get me wrong, this is still the development pre-release kit. But still there are already thousands of them all over the world. And they all have this error prone direct wire to board soldering in an extremely tight space. It didn't help at all that they lovelessly put a drop of hot snot on top of the wires that didn't even touch the PCB. Well, at least they made it obvious where to look for defects. I ended up desoldering everything to get a good look at that tiny circuit board. It has a DC barrel connector for the 5 volts wall plug adapter, in case your USB power supply is not strong enough, and a sync output for the camera module that's recording the infrared LEDs. And that's interesting, because USB communication only works from one device to another, and the data lines are going through this board untouched as far as I can see. But USB mini plugs have five pins, so one extra connection, and that can be used to send the sync signal from the rift back to this tiny intermediate board. Also, it freaked me out a bit that they connected the red and the black wires directly together, but they used the shielding for the ground connection. So probably that's to be able to handle a little bit more current. But when I manually fed in 5 volts and ground from my current limiting power supply into the correct pins, I got overcurrent condition every single time. Did a quick continuity test to confirm what I knew already. The ground and the 5 volt pins are shorted. That's usually bad news. It could have taken us hours or even weeks to figure out which part exactly was causing the short. But against all likelihood, I just try to desolder C2, which is probably a ceramic capacitor, and it turned out to be bingo. That's the first time in my entire electronics career that I encounter a shorted ceramic capacitor. But well, I'm happy. Everything works fine without it. We replaced it anyway with a generic 104 ceramic cap. Uh, just to provide some basic DC ripple filtering, which was probably the intended purpose for that thing. Well, camera battery finally died for good, uh, and so I've got no celebration shots. But I put a little bit of epoxy on those solder joints to provide some strength, closed it all up again, and well, that's it for today. Thanks for watching.